climb to the heights of life where the soul is at home with God. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go. The way of the cross leads home. Then I bid farewell to the way of the world to walk in it never more. For my Lord says, come, and I ask my home where he waits at the open door. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go. The way of the cross leads home. Amen. Please remain standing for prayer. Brother Ted, would you lead us in? Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come to your house tonight. And I pray that you will bless our time together. Be with all the classes back in the back and, and the little kids as well as our, our teenagers. And Lord, be with us here today, tonight, uh, in, uh, here in the auditorium as the pastor will break forth the word of God here in just a little bit in the book of Revelation. And Lord, I pray that you might uh, help us to learn something and, uh, and or refresh our minds and our hearts. And Lord, that we might be able to use it to, to uh, further our influence for the for the good and for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name I pray, amen. Amen, you may be seated. I'd like to recognize any, anyone visiting tonight with us for the first time? Anyone like that? First time visiting? I don't see any new faces. We're glad that you're here with us tonight, though. I'd like to turn on over to song number 349, and while you're doing that, please turn your cell phone off if you would. We'd appreciate that very much. <coughs> you can remain seated as we sing glory to his name. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. All right, but Ted, give us our announcements. Huh? Let's see. I just want you to turn this thing on. Is that the down? There we go. All right, I need a lot of light here. Uh, uh, because I didn't write these announcements, Brother Jared did. <laughs> and if Brother Jared or the preacher writes it, I need all the help I can get whenever I read it. And you understand what I'm saying, don't you? Uh, yeah, all right. So anyway, we just in just a few brief announcements, we're glad you're here tonight, by the way. And uh, we want to encourage you, tomorrow night we will be having our Bible Institute class starting at 6 o'clock be my class we'll be starting the book of Joshua and then the preacher will be continuing his study and then Saturday morning we'll be having our men's prayer breakfast 
at 8 o'clock. We want to encourage you to come for that as well. And then Sunday morning and uh, all day Sunday, we'll be having our regular scheduled service. 10 o'clock for Sunday school, 11 o'clock preaching, and then 6.30 in the evening will be our evening services, okay? All right, and don't forget to, to sign up. There's still time for you to sign up for the couples retreat, I guess, right? out there in the front, and uh, that'll be April the 4th. You'll be there on, going on the 3rd, on the Friday, spending the night. Of course, they'll tell you all the details for that out there in the lobby, okay? All right, ushers, if you would come at this time. Brother Charles, why don't you come on up here and pray for us, brother? Uh, we'd appreciate all y'all here tonight. God bless you. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you've allowed us to be here for this Wednesday evening prayer meeting Bible study time. Lord, thankful for the faithful people that came out tonight. And Lord, we, uh, just in a matter of days, Lord, it seems like times have gotten dark in our country. And Lord, I pray that you'll be with our country. Lord, I pray that you help this virus to, to work its way through and get out of here pretty quick. And I pray that you'd be with the uh, older folks uh, that the doctors are telling us are most vulnerable to this virus. Lord, I pray that you'd uh, be with the older population in our country and around the world and, and as well here in, in, in our household of faith, Lord. I pray that you be with Cornerstone Baptist and watch over, put a hedge about us. And Lord, we uh, each time we take up offering, Lord, we're reminded of just how good you are to us financially. Lord, I pray that you help us all uh, to give with a cheerful heart today. Help us to give as unto the Lord. And Lord, I pray that you be with everything that goes on on this property tonight with Brother Jared and the teens, with Brother Dave and Rhonda and the kids' club. Be with what's going on in the fellowship hall and the kids' class going on in the upper part of the building. Lord, be with uh, Brother Mike tonight as he preaches. I pray that you'd bless everything that goes on here tonight. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs> Well, amen. God bless you. Appreciate you being here tonight on this Wednesday night, our uh, prayer meeting time, Bible study time. And uh, before that I actually get into the uh, prayer meeting here tonight, uh, there's something that uh, I, I, guess I'm, well, I guess I know I'm going to address uh, this situation. I have actually put together something this afternoon, Jared and I did, that uh, Miss Joanne will put on our website that will be out there in a seven or eight minute little deal. Uh, there in my office, but I, I, I want to say a couple of things tonight before that I actually start the prayer meeting time, some stuff for you to pray for. Now, obviously, there's a situation in our nation tonight uh, that we do need to pray about, and in more ways than one, I, I think that prayer is the key thing, the key thing of everything in life. We need to pray for our country, pray for our leaders, uh, and uh, pray that they make the right decisions, and, and by the way, uh, pray they make the decisions to do the right thing and not do the wrong thing. There's a huge uh, area there as well, and we just need to pray for, uh, the, obviously, the folks that are sick and those that uh, uh, have uh, lost loved ones in it. Just pray that God would give them some comfort. Now, on the other end of this thing, I, I'm asked quite a bit. matter of fact, I've been asked a lot the last couple of days uh, what did, uh, how I think that we ought to react. How should Christians react to this? How should churches react to it? I've been asked how we're going to react to it and how I'm going to react to it. And uh, maybe I should have said something Sunday. I'll just tell you what I did Sunday. I didn't do anything. I just went on what I was doing. And, uh, but in, after praying about it and thinking about it, God began to give me a little bit of an insight of, of what I ought to do. And so I'm going to do that with you all right now. Hopefully it won't take very long. And then we'll have our prayer meeting. But if you have your Bible tonight, I want you to turn with me to Psalm 91. I want you to turn to Psalm 91. 
I'm, I'm going to tell you what I've been telling people the last couple of days. People say, Preacher, what do you, how do you think we ought to react to this? And I've, this has got to be sort of a, an answer that I give them. I say, I want you to read Psalm 91 and then come back to me. I want you to read Psalm 91 and I want you to come back to me. After you read Psalm 91, I want you to tell me how you should react. And so we're going to read Psalm 91 tonight, at least the first 10 verses. And uh, then we're going, I'm, I'm going to make some statements out of Psalm 91. And I'm going to take you to another psalm in just a moment after I get done with that. And I want to give you what I think that God's reaction to, for a child of God ought to be. Not just for this, but for any natural disaster, for any storm that's coming, for any problem that's coming down the road, for anything that's thrown out. I, I think this is how that God wants us to react and live in life. Psalm 91, verse number 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the hour, hour that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh to thy dwelling. Now here's an interesting psalm. Uh, it's an interesting psalm of the faith of God. Now in everything in life, certainly in this, uh, with this uh, coronavirus, this uh, pandemic that's going on, uh, we, you, you face it one of two ways. You either face it by faith that God is in control or you face it with fear and you begin to let panic seize hold of you. Now the truth of the matter is in anything in life, if you let fear guide you, you're about to make some bad choices. Amen. I don't care what it is in life. I don't care anything in life. When fear is the motivating factor Whatever it is, you are now making some poor choices because you're not making choices based on the Word of God. You're not even making choices based on logic. You're now making choices based on panic and fear. I recognize that uh, anyone can have uh, uh, good people. This passage, sometimes people, I said today when I use this passage, I'm not saying it's because someone gets... Uh, sick that they're evil. My, I've had some pretty rough things in my life. If there's any one thing that I've learned whenever I was diagnosed with cancer and said you're going to die, I've got two ways to face it. I can either panic and start trying to change all kinds of things in my life. And those of you who are around that, you know what I did. I didn't change one iota. I did exactly the same thing in my life to the very day they cut me open and said I wouldn't come off the table. Because you either live by faith or fear. One or the other. You can't live in a mixture of it. God's not the author of fear. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, joy, and a sound mind. And so I refuse to live in fear. Now, let me throw one other thing in this. You're, you're in Psalm 91. Go to Psalm 121, or 27, excuse me. I want to show you something else. Not only do I have to live in faith and not fear, I want you to notice something else that, that Psalm 127, verse number 1 says. And you're going to, we're going to couple that together with faith or fear. In Psalm 127, verse number 1 says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Now watch this next phrase. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Now the psalmist says here, he says, listen, if God doesn't build it, you can do all of your labor and it's in vain. He says, furthermore, if the watchman rises and God's not keeping the city, then it's in vain. Now, the great truth of the matter is this. I, I must live this life by faith. 
trusting that God is in control. You say, well, you may get it. I may get it. And I'm not going to live in fear if I get it. I'm, I'm going to face it just like I did everything else I've had. God's in control of this. It's for his glory, for his good. And if it's my time to go to heaven, then it's my time to go to heaven. There's great truth in that. You see, unless the Lord watches you, everything else we're doing is vain. Unless God is put first in it, everything else you do is in vanity. So how am I going to face it? I'm going to face it like I face everything else in life. Faith. That God is in control. The hairs of my head are numbered. And a sparrow can't fall to the ground unless he lets it. And if that's true, and Jesus said it is, then I'm going to face this as I face everything else by faith. I'm going to use some prudence. I told somebody the other day, I said, we're living in the part of the country where at this point there's very little. I know some other places have more. It might change the direction, the way you'll do it. In our county, it's very little. So I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. Use some prudence. Use some little bit of wisdom. I understand that. I'm going to obey whatever the law says. At this point, we're still here. I'm going to meet. And so I just told folks, we're going to be here Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. We're going to keep doing what we're doing. Because you know one of the things that helps you in a time like this is to be encouraged. You know one of the things that discourages you is solitude. One of the things that will encourage you is fellowship with God's people, prayer with God's people, hearing God's people sing, hearing the word of God taught and preached. It will help you. And so we're going to do that. I understand there are some folks that may feel that you're um, that they may feel that they are uh, acceptable to some stuff. I understand that. There's no judgment in that. And I'll pray for that. But I'm going to tell you, even at that, it's not wise for you to live in fear. Fear is a horrible master, and it'll destroy you. Prudence, absolutely. Facing something in wisdom, absolutely. I'm not going to cast myself off the pinnacle of the temple. I'm not going to do that. But I tell you what, I'm going to do. I'm going to face it with faith. And so that's what we're doing as a church. And so I just tell folks, I'm going to keep doing what we're doing. I'm going to keep doing what we're doing. And I'm going to take it one day at a time and see how God, God works it out. And um, however else that may sound, I just encourage you to do it by faith, not by fear. Your whole life. Because you know what? In a few weeks, this too will pass. And if you build in you now to face life with fear, the next, and there will be something else. The next thing that comes along, fear immediately sets again. Where and when does it stop? It never stops. Unless you face it by faith. That if God lets me have it, and this is my time to go, it's my time. That here I am, and here I'm going to serve until God takes me home. And there's great truth in that. There's great truth in that. All right, let's have a prayer meeting time. I've said enough of that tonight. Hopefully that didn't take too long. Hopefully that answers a couple of questions. At least an answer a question where I think that Christians ought to stand and how we ought to stand. You find uh, tonight as we uh, have our prayer meeting, and there's several things here listed and some things I'll give you in a moment that have been given. Uh, continue to pray that God will just be with us. We need to pray for our nation. I already said. Pray that God would use this to help bring our nation to a point of revival. Our nation needs revival. There's no doubt about it. Uh, it needs revival. It needs a revival of faith in God. It needs a revival of morality, and going back and serving God. And so pray for our nation. Pray for our church. Our churches are the ones that are going to be used by God. It's his people that always start revival. And so we ought to pray that God would be with us and, and, and uh, encourage us and use us in that, va in that fashion. Uh, so do pray for these folks. Do continue to pray for uh, uh, Sharon Van Etten. I uh, spoke to her uh, Sunday. The cancer is uh, still... Uh, obviously still there. They tell her it's terminal. And uh, just pray for her. She's still, by the way, just plugging on with that. So we'll do pray for that. Pray for Brother Ken Lindsay. Brother Ken has been uh, a little weak this week. He didn't take a treatment uh, a couple days ago or maybe yesterday. Uh, but overall, they think the numbers are increasing and he's looking a little better. So thank the Lord for that. And so just keep praying for Brother Ken. Keep praying for Miss Melissa and Maddie and Ruby in prayer. Would ask you to continue to pray uh, for my mom. Lord, just touch her body and help her physically. And also, Miss Jackie Richards, 
uh, and, and brother Cindy and Miss uh, uh, and brother uh, brother Cindy and Miss. Uh, let me get this straight a minute. Let me back up. Brother Daniel and Miss Cindy Sardar were both here Sunday, and uh, so do pray for their uh, for them physically uh, as they're recuperating. Both of them from some uh, some situations there, physical problems in their lives. Uh, Sister Kay Selby was here Sunday. Pray for Miss Kay that the Lord continue to help her to heal with the stroke. And just uh, continue to pray for her, if you will, her brother Paul. Pray for a little Isabella Hoover. The Lord just touched little Isabella. She's uh, having some difficulties now. They're having a hard time sort of diagnosing what's going on with her. And so pray for Isabella, if you will, and Scott and Kim, remember them. And we do thank you for praying for uh, for little Waylon and just continue to pray for him. The Lord just be with him, lift him up. Uh, brother Jack, Miss Opal Cross, continue to pray for them. Miss Opal is uh, taking... Uh, quite a few treatments. It's caused her to uh, have quite a bit of uh, weakness uh, now, but you pray for her. And brother, brother Jack, obviously, is not getting around well at all, so do pray for them, if you will. Uh, continue to pray for Brother Rocky Long. The Lord, just touch him, lift him up. Brother Rocky, Miss Willie, uh, physically. Uh, brother Jack Imes is through the first round of treatments now with uh, lung cancer. Everything seems to have went well. It'll have to be just a few weeks before it'll settle down. They'll go back and do another test. See where it's at, but continue to pray for Brother Jack. Uh, continue to pray for Billy Brown, if you will. Lord, just touch her physically and lift her up. Brother Raymond Henry had the second hip replacement. Everything went well, but he is in a lot of pain with that, so do pray for Brother Raymond. Miss Kathy Frady has been actually coming. Just pray, Lord, just continue to touch her to, uh, as she had the recuperating from the surgery and looking forward to something else happening as well, so do pray for her another surgery. Continue to pray for little Ashley Greenwood. They have found a tumor in her abdomen area, and pray for her, please. And continue to pray for Sister Kathy Totten. Physically, the Lord just touch her uh, body there, if you will, and remember that. And continue to pray for Kelsey King. By the way, the Lord has really touched in that uh, situation as well with the cancer, and so do pray for her, that the Lord just be with her and help her. Pray for Sister Judy Isham. She had some oral surgery today and is at home. Y'all pray for Miss Judy. The Lord be with her and lift her up, please. I uh, do uh, continue to pray. I should have took those things out of the hospital. Brother Marvin's obviously not in the hospital. He's here, and so is Joy Smith out of the hospital. Continue to pray, though, for Brother Bobby Lamont. Many of y'all may know Brother Bobby. He's uh, over the uh, Bible Literature Missionary Foundation. He had an uh, open-heart surgery Monday that did three bypasses on him. I talked to him today. He's actually out in a room, but uh, he asked us to pray for him, and so you pray for Brother Bobby, if you will. Uh, do continue to pray for uh, Sister Dorothy Henry. She was to have a valve replacement yesterday. They have postponed that indefinitely. But do pray for Miss Dorothy as she has uh, still got some uh, issues. And uh, then uh, they actually operate on Lacey Young today as well for her cancer. Not sure if they were able to get everything or not, but just do pray for her, if you will. Pray Brother Raymond Henry. I didn't mention him. Miss Gloria Garcia did have surgery on Monday, and uh, do pray for her, if you will. And then uh, Sister Pam Prince has some surgery coming up, if you will. Do remember that, if you will. Also, pray, if you will, for Sister. Uh, uh, we've got had her listed on the, the list here, but pray for Susie, uh, Miss Susie's uh, daughter, Mary Peebles. She has the coronavirus, and so I want you all to pray for her. She's in North Carolina. But do pray for her, if you will, and pray God to just be with her and help her there. Sister Susie Murphy's daughter, and do pray for Mary, if you will. All right? Now, so remember these prayer requests, if you will. Now, let me give you these others here. Pray, if you will, for John Weller and his Daniel Goldman's, or Bud Goldman's brother, Charlie Goldman's brother. Uh, he has cancer, and do pray for him physically, if you will. Pray for William Christmas. He is a uh, uh, just a, a little five-year-old boy. He has juvenile arthritis, and uh, he's having a, a, a tough time with that. And so pray for him, if you will, and for his family. And uh, just said, do remember uh, Mary Peebles and pray for her. And also uh, pray for Josh, Josh Murphy. Both of them are sick. And, uh, oh, I should have read this. They cleared her today. Is that she's been cleared? Very good, very good. She's still sick, but she's been cleared of that. That's good. Thank the Lord for that. Amen. And so do remember that tonight and pray for that, if you will. And uh, then um, uh, pray, if you will, for, um, uh, for Ernie Reeves for some health issue. Uh, do remember here, uh, Lord, just uh, be with that and remember that, if you will. And do pray for our nation, pray for our medical uh, staff during this time. They'll be able to help folk there and uh, remember that. Uh, pray for Annette Harris, if you will. Uh, that's Kelly Harris's mother. She has a, uh, 
uh, going to have that. She's got some physical issues and possible biopsy, and so we pray for her, if you will. Uh, remember that in your prayers, and we'd appreciate it. All right, make the unspoken request, if you will, with the upraised hand. And all of you will and can come and gather around the altar, and uh, Brother Ted is going to uh, come, and he's going to uh, lead us uh, in prayer. And uh, let's just uh, uh, have a time of prayer and ask God to be with us and help us there and remember these things in prayer. God in heaven, we, we do want to thank you for the privilege of being able to come directly to your throne, and we realize that it has been made possible only because of what Jesus did, your son, your only begotten son, did for us on Calvary. And so we come tonight uh, asking you to listen to the prayers and requests and petitions that we make known to thee, but first of all, we do want to praise you and thank you for all the many wonderful things that you have done for us and given to us, and we are thankful for the country that we do live in. We're thankful for the church that you've given to us and for our pastor, and Lord, we're thankful for this wonderful church family, and Father, I pray that you would just watch over and protect every one of our church family and put a hedge about them. And Lord, I, I do uh, thank you for the privilege of being able to, to uh, be on staff here. And Lord, I just ask that you would uh, help us to, to be a blessing to as many as possible we can. We come to you asking you that you would be with some of these request we'd ask that you'd be with uh, our missionary of the week brother John Warnicke that's in Idaho and a, and a young church and uh, Lord I ask that you would be with him give him wisdom I do pray for all the un, unspoken prayer requests that was made known tonight just a moment ago and Lord it's very real to each and every individual and God I ask that you would be in their lives direct them in, in their particular situation and problem, and Lord, that you might uh, have your will and way in their lives. Dear God, we do pray for those folks that have been mentioned. Some of them are friends of ours, and, and, uh, and some of them are part of our church family. Some of them are just acquaintances of our church, but Lord, I just ask that you would be with um, Sharon Van Etten, who has cancer, and also Ken Lindsay. And Lord, we do pray for Jack Imes and Opal Cross, and uh, we pray for Kelsey King, and, and then Lord, we pray for Lacey Young, who had her surgery today for cancer. God, I'd ask that you would just touch their bodies, and Lord, that you might uh, heal them of that, uh, either through the surgeries or through uh, the treatments that they're getting. But, Lord, we just ask that you would strengthen them and their families in a very particular way during this time of their lives. We do pray for strength for uh, Ann Curley and also uh, for Jackie Richards. And we also ask that you would continue to be with Cindy and Daniel Sardar. It's been good to be able to see them in the services recently. Then, Lord, I ask that you would also be with Kay Selby as she's recovering uh, from her stroke that she had, and it has been good to be able to see her as well, and also Isabella Hoover. And Lord, that you would just be with that little girl. I know you've brought her through an awful lot, as well as Waylon. You brought those two individuals through, an, uh, th through some pretty deep waters, and you brought their families, and you've, uh, Lord, I just uh, ask that you would continue to be with them and their families and strengthen them. And uh, Lord, I, I pray that you'd be with Rocky Long. I know that uh, many times each and every day he wakes up with a lot of pain from his arthritis. And God, that you'd be with uh, him and, and uh, uh, Willie as well. And then be with Billy Brown. 
and also Kathy Frayden. It's been so good to be able to see her here as well and pray for her continued recovery. I do pray for Kathy Totten as well and, and also uh, uh, little Ashley uh, uh, Greenwood who has a tumor. And God, I pray that you'd be with, uh, be with her. And then be with uh, Susie Murphy's um, uh, daughter who has the uh, uh, coronavirus. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, uh, be with her and, Lord, that she might be able to uh, overcome this, uh, this virus in her life over in North Carolina. And then, God, we pray for Judy Isham, who had oral surgery today. And we pray for uh, Joey Smith, who's... Uh, recovering uh, now from his surgery, very serious. We're thankful for your uh, your watch care over him. And then Bobby Lamont as he is recovering from uh, bypass heart surgery, and a very dear friend of our pastor and our church, and a partner in our scripture ministry here. And Lord, I pray you'll be with him and his family now as well. We do ask that you would be with Dorothy Henry, who has a, a, a valve replacement that needs to be uh, taken place in her, in, her, in her heart. And Lord, I pray you'd be with her as while she awaits that. And then also as Raymond Henry uh, has uh, had his, uh, getting ready to have his other surgery. And then Gloria Garcia, who has had surgery. And also Pam Prince, who's going to have surgery. Lord, I pray you'd be with them, each of them, and uh, encourage them because uh, we know how sometimes the uh, fear of the unknown is, is there. But, Lord, uh, we know that you, you hold the future. And, Lord, I pray that you, they would trust in you and help, help them during this time. We do pray for Annette uh, uh, Harris, Lord, that uh, has a CT scan done today. And, Lord, that you might be with, uh, be with uh, her and then, Lord, we also pray that you would be with uh, uh, the doctors and the nurses during this, during this critical time uh, all across the country. I know that they, they carry a lot of the load there and uh, in the doctor's offices and in the hospitals. I pray you'd be with them. And then also, Mary People, uh, Lord, that you'd be with, uh, uh, be with uh, her. And then, Lord, I'd ask that you'd be with uh, uh, William Christmas. Uh, Lord, I, I ask that these are requested by Joe and Kathy Farmer, who has juvenile arthritis. And, Lord, I ask that you would be with, uh, with uh, William. And then also John Weller, who has cancer. And he's uh, Go Bud, Bud Goldman's brother. And, Lord, I ask that you would be with him and as he encounters the issues that he's going to encounter uh, with that with that cancer. Now, Lord, I I pray for our church. I pray for the people of our church and all the different ministries that we have going on here. And Lord, we uh, would ask that you would be with uh, our pastor tonight as he gets ready to uh, to deliver the word of God to us. And Lord, I pray that it might be an encouragement to us. And Lord, we, we thank you once again for the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for us on Calvary. And I love you and thank you for what you've done for me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, amen. God bless you. Appreciate you being here tonight. You have your Bible. Open with me, if you will, to the book of the Revelation, chapter number 5. Revelation chapter 5. We got down through last week, down through verse 7. Uh, we have, uh, I have enjoyed, I always enjoy the book of the Revelation. Let me sort of bring it to speed. We'll pick up in verse 8 in just a moment here. Uh, as uh, we, be, we begin tonight, we'll see how far we can get in the book of the Revelation. Revelation. As we have looked in chapter 5, uh, we have uh, seen where that John has now, in chapter 4, saw the throne. He has seen Christ on the throne. He's seen the uh, 24 elders seated around the throne, the four beasts around the throne, 
the magnificence of the power and glory of the throne. And then you find in uh, chapter 5 that uh, there is a, uh, that Christ, uh, on the throne, that Christ is on the throne, there is a book written, written uh, which was the book of life. And no one was able to open the book, but Jesus, he prevailed to do so. And we looked at that book of life last week, what that is and is not. It is a book that has everyone's name, is ever conceived, is written in it. And if someone refuses to accept Christ as their Savior, their name is blotted out of that book. It will be opened by Christ at the judgment seat. He will show them where their name was and where their name was blotted out and then show them that they had an opportunity to trust Christ and they rejected it and they are justly being thrown into the lake of fire. And so we, we spent quite a bit of time upon that down through verse 7. We pick up verse number 8, it says, And when he had taken the book, talking about Jesus, the Lamb of God, had taken the book, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lord, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. Now you find that he takes the book, and as he takes the book, that you uh, you, you you see these four beasts and these uh, twenty-four elders. They fall down and they worship the Lord. It's interesting that there's a couple of things they have. It says they have harps, those uh, stringed instruments there, and they are uh, using those to uh, sing praise and glory and honor to our Lord. Uh, and they fall down there in front of Christ and they are praising him. Not only that, notice, if you will, in the last part of verse number 8, uh, it says, and they have vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. I couldn't help but, as I study this and, and read that, I can't help but think, if you go back to the uh, tabernacle in the wilderness and then to the temple that Solomon built, uh, that one of the, the seven key pieces of furniture inside the tabernacle of the wilderness in the holy place was the uh, table of incense. And you had this offering there that every day at 6 in the morning and every day at 6 in the evening, there was incense offered upon that table. It was a special uh, formulation of incense. As a matter of fact, it was, a, it was a, uh, uh, against uh, all the, the law for that incense to be uh, used anywhere but in the temple. It was very specifically made. Uh, God gave the formulation of it. Uh, but what did that represent? Every time they went in there, why were they burning that incense? Burning that incense and the odor of that uh, would uh, fill the tabernacle and then would fill the temple. What did it represent? It represented this. Uh, these 24 elders have these, uh, these harps, and we understand that. Those harps are used to, uh, to, to sing psalms and hymns and praise our God which is worthy of the praise, the Lamb that is worthy. But what are the vials? The vials represent the odors just much like the incense did. It is the prayers of saints. Boy, isn't that a great truth tonight? Isn't it a great truth that whenever that we pray, we just had a prayer meeting. Whenever you have a prayer meeting in your home with your family or you have a it's a private time of prayer that, that goes up before God. And it is something that is an odor that God smells. And God is able to not only hear what we're doing, but it is something that brings uh, to his remembrance what is happening. And so we find this takes place in verse number 8. Uh, verse number 9, notice what else they do. Uh, these 24 elders. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Now I want you to notice that as they are there, they're singing before God, before Christ, and he is worthy to take the book, not only to take the book, he is worthy to open the seals. Now notice what they attach to that worthiness in verse number 9. Uh, and they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Watch this. For thou wast slain. Now why is he worthy? 
He is worthy because he gave his life for mankind. He gave his life so that every person that is ever born, ever will be born, would have an opportunity to trust Christ. Now notice, he was slain. He died in our place. Notice the next thing it says, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. There will be nobody in heaven that gets there outside the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a great truth in this. Uh, oftentimes I hear people say, well, in the Old Testament they were redeemed by keeping the law. Well, that's a lie. If, if they ever got redeemed by keeping the law, they'd still do it today. The reason Christ came and died is because that there's none righteous, no, not one. The reason Christ died on Calvary is because that no one could ever live perfect enough to be saved. And so the Old Testament saints uh, were simply looking forward to the coming Messiah because that was the will of God. Christ is the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. It was plan A. God gave the first messianic prophecy there to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3.15, uh, that the seed of a woman would bruise the head of Satan, making reference to the, uh, the coming Messiah, the virgin birth. And those Old Testament saints were looking forward that Jesus would come, and we're simply looking back that he did. They had faith that he would. We have faith that he has. But the faith was still the object of, of our faith, and their faith is the same object, which is Christ himself. And so everyone that is ever going to be in heaven is going to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And so he's worthy to take the book, and he took the book, and he's worthy because he was slain. He is worthy because he has redeemed us with his own blood. Now, I like the last part of verse number 9. I want you to notice it says that he has, uh, and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and every tongue and people and nation. So there are going to be people out of every, every people group, every nation all around the world are going to be in heaven because they've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Boy, ain't that the great truth. Now, let's throw something else in here, too. Notice that they're redeemed out of every nation, every people, every kindred, every tongue by the blood of the Lamb. It didn't say they were redeemed by their religion. Every once in a while, I'll deal with somebody and say, Well, I believe that uh, it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you sincerely believe it. Uh, we People, and they start naming other parts of the world, other countries, and naming other religions. Well, they're sincere, and they'll get to heaven. That's not what this says. This is very clear that the only ones that are in heaven are the ones that are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And so we find here that he comes before the throne and Jesus now is able to take the book of life and he's able to open the book of life. He's able to loose the seals thereof. He's able to read it and look upon it. And, and he had, was slain for us. We call that the vicarious suffering of Christ. He died in our place. And then we find that he is going to redeem us and has redeemed us by his blood out of every nation, kindred, people, and tongue. Verse number 10. Here is their praise and what they're saying in their song. It continues. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Now notice something else that these 24 elders have said. said now, not only have you redeemed us, not only have, have you saved us from... Uh, out of every nation, by the blood of the Lamb. Not only that, that God has now made the redeemed kings and priests unto Him. Boy, there's a great truth in that. What a position that we have in Christ. What a position that we have that we have been made kings and priests under our God. Uh, there, there is a principle given here that we are going... Uh, to rule and reign with him. What a great truth that he has given. Verse number 11. And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Verse number 11 is an interesting verse. You see, as God is giving this to John, 
and he and he Jesus comes and he takes the book of life out of the, the hand of the of the Father on the throne, and he's worthy to open the book because he is the line of the tribe of Judah. He was the lamb that was slain. He has this great power, there's great glory and honor given to him by the 24 elders. But then it mentions specifically in verse number 11, the angels. Now, by the way, it's the only place that it's going to mention, uh, he even begins to try to number the angels in heaven. Uh, we, we, we try to, oftentimes we uh, try to figure out the population of the earth. Uh, there's a little over 7 billion people on the face of the earth. Now, that's an astronomical number. Uh, I, listen, I, I'm old enough to remember the first time I ever heard the population of the earth, uh, I was in high school, it was 3.5 billion. And that's, an, that's an astounding thing. It has more than doubled in my lifetime. It's amazing. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, people try to say, well, how many angels are there? Well, here is the only verse in Scripture that even gives you a glimpse, and by the way, I said a glimpse of how many angels there are. Now, people die and go to heaven, they do not become angels. I know that is a false doctrine that is purported and perpetuated by a lot of uh, even religions. But whenever that you and I die and we go to heaven, we are still people. We are still human beings. We do not become angels, and angels do not become people. There's a great truth in that. Uh, angels uh, have an appearance as man because some have entertained angels in unawares thinking they were people, that they were men. But we uh, do not become angels. And so these angels that we are seeing in verse number 11 are those angels that are around the throne and they are praising Jesus and they're giving glory and honor to him for who he is. Now it gives us a little bit of a number. I don't think you can actually get an accurate number there. It just gives us a little bit of a number. And the reason, I'll explain why. 10,000 times 10,000. What a number. That is 100 million. If you multiply 10,000 times 10,000, that's 100 million. And by the way, that's a great big number. Great big number. Now, I, I'll make a reference here before I move on and, and get the other part of that verse about the number. Uh, it's interesting. We say, well, that's a, that's a, a lot of uh, uh, angels, but... Well, there's more people than that. Do you remember in the Old Testament when Hezekiah was, uh, was ruling and the Assyrian king, uh, Snecharib, he sent his uh, army there uh, and besieged Jerusalem and, and uh, bragged that God could not stop him. And Hezekiah takes the letter and spreads it on the altar in the temple. And that night God sent one angel. One angel. And in one night, that one angel killed 185,000 men, one angel, one. One angel killed 185,000 men in one night. By the way, it sort of ruined Sennacherib's little thing about God not being able to take care of Jerusalem. Well, here we have 100 million just in 10,000 times 10,000. What kind of power do you think they have in their possession? More than we can really even uh, formulate. But that's not the number. Notice what it says in verse number 11. 10,000 times 10,000, which is 100 million, then thousands of thousands. I would think 100 million is thousands of thousands. But he, just, he numbers it like this. There was 10,000 times 10,000, it's 100 million, and, and then there are thousands and thousands. That's how come in one place it says it's an innumerable company of angels. Because we can't number it. It's a huge number. It's a huge number of angels. Now you might add them other zeros behind 100 million and you come out with 100 trillion, but it doesn't necessarily say that. It's a great number of angels. 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. And I only said that to say this. You and I have no idea what all God's created. We have no idea of the glory and majesty of what God's created. John's there in heaven and he sees the throne and the Father and he sees those four beasts around the throne and the 24 elders and the thunders and the lightnings and the sea of glass and, 
and, and, he, and he sees the book of life and the Lamb of God. He sees Christ shake the book and then he hears and sees the innumerable amount of angels. 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. The power of God. Every once in a while there's folk that wonder how that God is going to take care of everything he's going to do here. Well, he has great power, but he has a mighty, a mighty army of angels. Now I'll throw one other thing in here. A little later on we're going to come to a portion of this book where that Satan is going to give a description of Satan being cast out of heaven. I believe he was the, there were three archangels. The great vast majority of things that God does, he does in threes. And we know there were two archangels that are named, Michael and Gabriel. The only other angel that is named in the Bible is Lucifer. I believe he was the third archangel. And he drew one-third of the other angels with him when he rebelled against God. Now, I said that to say this. If this number in chapter 11 is the number of the angels still there, and that's two-thirds. Half of that number followed Satan in rebellion. What a mighty army of wickedness that we face in this world in the prince and power of the air. I need Jesus every day, and so do you. I need my great God protecting me, and so do you. Because the truth of the matter is, if one angel has the power to kill 185,000 men, one fallen angel still has more power than I can resist. And so does you. And so as I read verse number 11, it is something that just jumps out at me over the number of angels, the power of God, and why I need the Holy Ghost living inside of me and helping me every day. Because I am not able to overcome the wicked one in my flesh. What a great truth. Verse number 12. These angels are praising Jesus and notice what it says. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing." Now, I jotted those things down. There were seven things that these angels, this great company of angels and these elders are giving glory to Jesus. Now, it's important that I notice something here. Do you know who's getting the glory in heaven? Jesus. Do you know who's getting the preeminence in heaven? Jesus. Uh, either the Lamb of God. We're not going to receive glory in heaven. Jesus is. These 24 elders are obviously uh, some, some uh, great, great people, men of faith. But they themselves are falling down and giving glory to Jesus. They're not getting glory. It's interesting to me every once in a while that I hear people try to, well, when I get to heaven, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you what you're going to do when you get to heaven. Now listen closely. Number one, you're going to give glory to Jesus. Whatever else is true, you're going to give glory to Jesus. He is going to be the preeminent one in heaven, not me, not you. It's going to be His will, not mine. I often hear people say, well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to need this. No, you won't. You're going to worship Jesus. He is the one that has the preeminence, and He is the one that is worthy. I think that when you and I actually get to heaven, that we're going to understand that He is worthy of all power. He is worthy of all riches. He is worthy of the wisdom, the strength, the honor, and the glory, and the blessings. I think when we actually get there, and we see Him as He is, and we will be like Him then, that all of these things that folk claim that, well, this is what it's going to be like, are going to be far, far removed because we're going to see the great King of kings and Lord of lords and the great Lamb of God and we'll join in this great course of saying, you are worthy to receive power 
and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing because he is. It would do me good now if every day I just realized that he is the preeminent one and his will ought to be done in my life, not my will, but his will. His will ought to be done in the lives of every child of God because he is worthy and he is the preeminent one. Notice verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and as such as are in the sea <clears throat> and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Now you notice that it's not just the angels. Now it's not just the 24 elders and the four beasts. It's but every creature in the universe is giving glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, go back to chapter 4, verse number 11. I want you to notice what these 24 elders and four beasts say, and it sort of it, it, it dovetails and resonates with this. And it says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. And so we find that everything that's created on the face of this earth was created by God, by the Lord, for what purpose? For his pleasure. For his pleasure. And so we find over here now in the end of chapter 5 that everything is giving glory and honor to the Lord. Everything is in unison praising him. You know why? Because that's why he created it. You know why? It's because he is worthy. You know why? It's because that everything recognizes that He is God and that they are created because He created them and the blessing that He has given to them. I really don't think that you and I can really comprehend the mercy, grace that God has until we actually stand in heaven. Really. Really. I think we'll be like the Apostle John and we'll fall at his feet as dead when we actually realize the glory and holiness of heaven. When we stand in his majestic presence, when we stand in the presence of the Holy One of the Holy Creator, we will realize the grace that was extended for you and I to stand there. The mercy that was given when he shed his blood on Calvary, redeemed me out of my sin, I think it will be overwhelming and we'll realize thou art worthy. Now watch the last verse of this chapter, verse 14. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Now I want you to notice these four beasts that we've done looked at. They, amen. Glory. The word amen means so be it. He said amen. It's interesting to me. I thought about this is that every time I read one of these passages throughout the book of the Revelation as it's talking about what's going on in heaven, I guarantee you one thing, there's going to be some amen said in heaven. You're going to hear that in heaven. These four beasts are, amen, and, and then the four beasts, now watch it, they fall down and worship the Lamb. You know, it's interesting, we, we live in a generation which there's a lot of things that's said about worshiping Jesus. There's a lot of things that goes on in church services, and they say, well, we, we, we have a praise and worship team. Those two words don't go together. Those, this praise and worship does not mix in Scripture. It does not. You see, they were praising Him earlier as they were singing around the throne and, and the, the 24 elders had the harps and they were 
had the vials full of the odors, which were the prayers of saints. They were praising him, and the angels were glorifying him. But now there's worship, and how is the worship? They're on their face in front of Jesus. It's always amazing to me. They say, well, we're worshiping him, and they're up. No, you're not. I'll make you a challenge. You get your Bible, and you go through your Bible. You find every place where anybody worshiped, there was always, always, always contrition. There was always humility. They were always down in front of him, on their knees, on their face. It was not the other. Both of them have their place. There is a place for praise, but that is separate from worship. When there is a worship, it is with a humility and a humbleness and a recognition that we are in the presence of the Almighty because He redeemed us by His blood out of all kindreds, nations, peoples, and tongues. And then we just simply worship him. And tonight I'm going to close with that. We'll pick up in chapter 6 next week. Wonderful chapter. You're going to find out what happens when the, when the lamb begins to open the seals. But tonight as I give the invitation, I want to give the invitation like this. When is the last time you worshipped the Lord? When's the last time that you honestly realized his power? His glory. When's the last time that you actually worshipped Him in humility? That's a great truth. Tonight we ought to look at this great God we have. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our worship. Father, we thank You tonight for allowing us to be able to come out and have this time with You together in my house. You are and You have been so good to us. We ask you tonight that you'd help us. So we could just be used for the glory and honor of Christ. I pray now as we give this invitation, we'll use it. 